All right, I think we're live. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So uh, let's, I guess, do a sound uh, sound check. Brett, speak. Sound check. <laughs> sound check. That's I, what else are you supposed to say other than sound check? <laughs> right. Yeah. So this is Colonel Kurtz and Brett Dasovic. And Brett is from, um, I always want to fuck it up. So I always nope. stop. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> stop. Hi, guys. My name is Brett Dasovic. I can do it. My, I'm the host of Pop Culture Crisis, Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That is noon Pacific right here on YouTube. So I recommend everyone, you know, when you're done watching this tonight, go over and check out the channel. Great. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, let us know in the comments, are we about equal volume or just... Does Brett need to turn himself up or down, basically, is the question. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff we could cover, and we will get to a lot of things. And I know you've been covering some things on your channel on, on Pop Culture Crisis this week that, that I haven't even, wasn't even aware of. So that'll be good. I'm happy to talk about whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> the, the great thing about Fridays is then when it comes up, then I'm not, then I don't have to feel like I have to talk about anything that I've talked about over the week. So whatever you want to talk about, let's go. Yeah, you always seem very relaxed. And of course, you're coming straight off of a, what, two to three hour live stream that you just did, right? Yeah, we, I, we, get, we get done at five. So uh, uh, we, we we go live at uh, three every day. So it's usually between three and five. Some days go a little bit longer. I think today went about three, uh, two hours and 15 minutes. Yeah, as we discussed before, you do that, you know, every single weekday. And so so that's kind of nice, though, because you've already got the jitters out and you're just coming into this show just basically to chill, which I think is the right attitude for a Friday yes. night. So, OK, so I think a lot of my audience, many of them are Marilyn Manson supporters or at least people who have an interest in the extensive Marilyn Manson situation. And I wanted to, Reverend Rachel Wood just did his main accuser. She just did an interview, a long interview. It was almost two hours with Dr. Romani. Are you, were you familiar with Dr. Romani, no. Brett? Okay. So she has a huge following. I was familiar with her. I've watched some of her stuff before. She, um, I, I don't know if she's a psychiatrist or a psychologist, I think a psychologist, but she is, uh, she is a very prolific uh, creator on YouTube. She's done a lot of videos. She has over a million followers. <laughs> She's a big I deal. might have actually seen some of her stuff. Never mind. I might have actually seen some of her videos. Well, she's very smart okay. and she's, and she, she talks a lot about narcissism. So anyway, she has. Yes. A, okay. Yes. That's, narcissism I guess, lady. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. That's literally, yeah. I was about to say, yes, I've seen her work. And so I like her a lot and I still do. This didn't change my opinion of her. Uh, and, and in fact, if I believe that Evan Rachel Wood were telling the truth, then it would have been a lovely interview. But she had Evan Rachel Wood on her show, and it's not her main program. I guess it's a new channel that she started called Navigating Narcissism, and which is a catchy title. It's a good title. A lot of people trying to figure that out. <laughs> How the hell do you navigate around so many narcissists in our world? But anyway, so she had Evan Rachel Wood on there. And so the topic for this two-hour conversation was Evan Rachel Wood's past uh, experiences, she claims, of alleged abuse at the hands of Marilyn Manson, uh, mm -hmm. Brian Warner. So I wanted to look at some parts of the interview and get your reaction as someone who, tell me, well, I was going to say, I feel like is not, is kind of non-committal on this topic or haven't, you haven't looked into it a lot. Is that I, right? I don't want to be non-committal on all, uh, I, I'm sorry, but I tend to be non-committal on anything Me Too these days because when it involves people's personal lives, I just have a very hard time. I can, I'm happy to criticize individual aspects of stories where, where proof can be shown that they didn't say such a thing or they did say such a thing or there's proof that they did such a thing or didn't do such a thing. Sure. But uh, the, the fact that we take the 30,000 foot view of these extremely personal matters makes it very hard for me to take strong positions on a lot of it because I just don't know. And the human experience is a lot more complicated than that. Interacting with other people and certainly interpersonal relationships of a romantic nature are much more complicated than they tend to be laid out in these stories, which once they get their hand, once the media gets their hands on them, they tend to find a narrative and they go in a specific direction. But the world doesn't happen that way. 
we don't experience the world in the form of a narrative. We experience the world in the form of individual actions. And I tend to find that once the media gets their hands on it, no matter who it is, left, right, center, everyone's got a direction they want to push it, which is very different from experiencing it firsthand. So I don't know if it's because we see so much of it all the time, especially covering pop cultures. Like we see, we just see this stuff today about uh, a singer named Jason Derulo Who's getting, I saw like, that. What's happening to him? He's so getting basically, he uh, he pushed for sex with a woman that he was giving a record deal to, and it never, uh, nothing ever rose to the level of crimes. Just kind of uh, like like really, really psychological bad, pressure, bad behavior on his part, mm -hmm. but not crimes. And the article says you get the words, you get narcissist. She says she's got PTSD. Is that true? I don't know. But when you get so many of these cases. Week in, week out, day in, day out. It just, it becomes very hard. And maybe it's just being jaded, but it's very hard for me to take a stance one way or the other because both sides want you angry and in their corner. And I understand that reaction for those that feel very strongly about certain ones. But for me, I just have a, I have a real hard time being emotionally <laughs> invested in it because it's so hard to know what the truth is. Yeah, it is. And I'll respond to that one second. But we have a super chat. Shane H. Wilder. Ah. Thank you. He says, he's Miami when we have Kurt and Dasovic. I really exactly. like uh, I really like the combination of our last names. We sound like uh, it's like that old school CNN show Crossfire. And they had like yes. the two last names. What were their names? Ken Kinsley and what was the other guys? Anyway, people don't even know what I'm talking about. Yep. But um, OK, so. I absolutely I absolutely feel you on that. And I think that that is a very legitimate completely legitimate, honest perspective. And so, and you know what? I, I identify with that because I feel that about a lot of political stuff. Like I have a lot of people in my audience oh, yeah. who would like for me to be, I'm talking about even apart from the Me Too topic, mm. but which has kind of become like a specialty of mine, at least at the moment. But apart from that, I have a number of people in my audience who think it would be entertaining or, or cool. Or if I went more political and actually got into my political beliefs, well, you know, I hate to say it, but like, there's not a whole lot that I have a real solid feeling about these yep. days in terms of like telling any, who the hell am I to tell anyone what to vote for or who to vote for? <laughs> when it comes to politicians, you're always safe falling back on the general idea that they're evil. Left, right, <laughs> center. They're, they're bad people. They tend to be bad people. And sure, there might be outliers there, but getting your like getting really, really committed even to the outliers is is to me a waste of your time and effort. Yeah. So I, I understand. I kind of understand that in a way you're saying a version of that with the Me Too thing. Not that yeah. there aren't real victims or that there might not be real people who are being falsely accused, but that it is like it's kind of like the fog of war. Mm -hmm. It is so hard, especially when we talk about romantic relationships and what went on to I know to to feel like you're getting to the bottom of anything um, that. So, you know, with Evan Rachel Wood and Marilyn Manson, obviously, that is something that I have been looking at for over two years. and and. And, you know, obviously I think it's a hoax. I think that he's innocent and people can go to my channel if, and, and look if yeah. they want to see. I've broken it down. The reasons why all of that, that's not what we're doing here. But I am interested actually to get someone's perspective who is more, for lack of a better word, non-committal about, because here's the thing. When I watch this interview with Evan Rachel Wood, because, because I do believe she's a liar and, and a hoaxer, everything that I see is colored through that. So I just end up looking at it and thinking, yeah. wow, this is just really deranged. But 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 I, I'm curious how it comes across to people. Okay. In particular, I wanted to look at one particular part that had me personally scratching my head, but maybe it's just me. Okay. So I want to just like, I just want to do like a cold reading of it basically. And, and so okay. look at it. You tell me what you think, how it comes across to you, because I'm wondering if I'm reading it right. I was confused by something or kind of befuddled by something she said. Okay. Here we go. Let me, oh, I need to share my screen. Always forget to do that. Mm -mm -mm. And so I just want to make it clear too, like I don't uh, blame Dr. Romani at all for having her on there. And I don't, I hope nobody, you know, who supports Marilyn Manson gets on Dr. Romani's case because I feel like I can totally, you know, Evan Rachel Wood, in my opinion, she's, uh, she's snowed a lot of people, a lot of smart yeah. people. So it happens. Okay, here we go. Have it queued up. Law enforcement yep. can't help me. Okay, I don't know how yep. else to protect right. people. Yeah, I don't know how else to protect people or warn people except to put my yep. ass on the line. That's right. And then that, but that took <laughs> a toll on to you. That took a toll on you. So speaking of the toll on you, yeah. how is your healing going? There's good days and bad days. It's still really hard. 
some days like oh, everything feels really normal and then you get hit with another legal attack or an attack on your character in the press or some something coming and you're just like oh right i'm still i'm still in tango with this person i don't think this person's ever going away until they pass away honestly i don't know how they're ever going to stop i agree that's an awful feeling because it's like i've been going through this half of my life i was mm -hmm. 18 when it started i'll be 36 this year and I, i'm still going through it and that's it's a bummer to say the least, but my nervous system for the first time feels like it's calmer than it's ever been, but I've had to make decisions for my life so that I can be an op. op okay. Here's where, here's where, when she starts talking about her kid and the situation with her kid, here's where I started to get perplexed. So that was just kind of like setting it mm -hmm. up, but everybody listen now and, and tell me, I'm going to rewind it just a touch here since I'm talking over it. But uh, now she starts to talk about these decisions. And one of them apparently is, is this thing about her kid. And so I want us to look at it and then I'm, I'm going to compare this story versus the story that we got several <laughs> months ago in, in the news that she was disclosing. Okay. Okay. Like people are warned people except to put my yeah. ass on the line. That's right. And then that, but that took <laughs> a toll on to you. That took a toll on you. So speaking of the toll on you, yeah. how is your healing going? There's good days and bad days. Oh, sorry. Make decisions for my life so that I can be in op optimal health and that I can thrive and I can be happy and I can be clear headed. And one of the hardest decisions was leaving Los Angeles because this is where my, my child is. Mm -hmm. And I have to make this impossible decision of do I stay and stay in fight or flight and have my nervous system always be overacting and always looking over my shoulder. And believe me, I tried. I really, really tried mm -hmm. to hunker down and I fought as long as I possibly could. I was just like, I don't know how to be the best version of myself and to thrive and to fully heal if I don't leave this place. That was one of the hardest moments of realization for me of just like, the only way I can be the best mother mm -hmm. is if I leave. And that's been the hardest. Of course, I still have a wonderful relationship with my child and I always will and I will always remain connected with them and I will see them, but they can't live with me all the time. We have to live in different states now. And I don't feel like I had a lot of understanding and, and compassion in that area. But all that being said, once I, again, just had to think about the things I could control and make peace with the things that I... Okay, so I'm going to stop you there. Brett, do you have any like overall reaction before I... <laughs> And <laughs> bring out some things. Uh, why don't you first go ahead and tell me what you wanted to mention? Yeah, so here's the thing, and I don't know if some of you on the stream were getting this either, but um, this is really the first time that we've heard anything from Evan. We've heard anything about Evan Rachel Wood separating from her child because she psychologically was, for lack of a better word, too messed up to... I mean, I, here's my question, basically. What is she saying exactly? Not, not to be so stupid. It's the <laughs> idea here, because I remember the story about her, like, in the custody dispute with her her ex-husband, right? Was that yes, what it was? Yes, okay, so Jamie Bell. I, I remember that part of it, and I remember her trying to reframe the narrative of her leaving the state of California to be to sound like she was committing some type of selfless act as if she was what uh, sacrificing custody of her child so that she wouldn't have to, so that her child wouldn't have to be worried about Marilyn Manson. Was it yeah. Something like so that? it was about Marilyn Manson. That's exactly right. So that's, that's, that's what I'm scratching my head about is mm -hmm. that in, in the court documents and the Tennessee court documents. So long story short for people who aren't aware of this and I'll review it for you too. So she, uh, she had a baby years ago with the actor, Jamie Bell, and yes. I'll, okay. I'm going to put his, I'll put their picture up right now. Um, but she had a baby years ago. Okay. So she was with Marilyn Manson, Brian Warner, and then they split. And then she had been dating much earlier, Jamie Bell. In fact, she cheated on Jamie Bell uh, with Marilyn Manson and then she got together with Manson. So Whoa. anyway, after she and Manson broke up uh, the second time, she and Jamie Bell got back together. I'm bringing a picture up and, um, and they had um, a baby and they got married. I don't think it was legally binding. She said, but they got married uh, a ceremony and everything. So um, hold on. I'm bringing it up. Um, okay. So they had a kid, they split 
And for a while, apparently it was amicable, but then sometime around, I think it was 2020, 2020, 2021, I think 2020, um, she started withholding, Jamie Bell, Jamie Bell filed court documents claiming all of this. She started withholding the child and then basically, for lack of a better word, I mean, she kidnapped the kid that was supposed to reside in California where Jamie Bell also yeah. was. She kidnapped their child without authorization, um, without his permission or court's permission or anything and, and moved to Tennessee and then was for a while, Jamie Bell claimed, refusing to um, give him time with the child or to come back to California. And so several months ago, I heard through sources that she had lost custody of her child as a result of this, as a result of her, her intransigence and her infractions as related to the custody agreements and the law, custody mm. law. And so she had lost custody for a while. And then, and then when I reported that like a week later, she actually disclosed in reports that came out uh, that she uh, that she had voluntarily given up custody as a sacrificial act, like you said, because she was afraid because of Marilyn Manson and the threat of Marilyn Manson that she claimed she was afraid yeah. for the safety of her child. The, the number one thing that I take away from any situation like this with a celebrity is that they know exactly how to frame and reframe all of their personal business to benefit them either <laughs> professionally yeah. or in this case, uh, I guess the hope would be that she's able to reframe this entire incident to make herself more sympathetic to the doctor's audience on that podcast. Again, not knowing whether any of that is true or not. Right, I'm always right. weary of anybody who presents me a story in which they are unequivocally the only good guy or the only good girl for lack of a better term, uh, like where they're the, the, w the one party that has been wronged and they're the only one that comes out of this losing anything because that just reeks of a story being shifted and adjusted and manipulated for the sake of that person being able to gain something from it. And I right. understand that when you're giving an interview like that, um, my guess is like not having what listened to you said this lady's this is like a new a new uh segment this lady's doing. Like, my guess is that when you're talking to people and the name and the number one focus of it is trauma or dealing with narcissists or something like <laughs> right. that, right? Which, by the way, that that term, I'm sorry, but that it's it's a buzzword now, it and so is anytime. Anytime somebody gives me a he said, she said story in which he or she are the only ones giving me that story and they start with something about narcissists, my antenna goes up that maybe they're not lying, but they're definitely not telling me the whole truth because you're reframing it as if you're the hero survivor of a story. And very rarely, except for maybe in the worst cases, is the real world ever that simple or that cleanly uh, that that cleanly explained right so. right no I, I i absolutely agree with you and we talked about last week you know this question of whether whether psychology particularly pop psychology has become maybe a little too deeply enmeshed in in, in our in our thought processes and our expression in society um so I think that I think it is really interesting here, though, that for whatever reason, you know, and, and to be charitable, you could say that she's that Evan Rachel Wood is just trying to reframe her experience for the sake of, of this, this show in this context, or mm -hmm. take the view that I have that it, there's something more, you know, problematic going on. But it does seem to be a shift from blaming Marilyn Manson to and, and and asserting that there's this real fear, this sense of, of fear mm -hmm. of Manson to now the idea that she had to go away because she psychologically was so damaged by Manson mm -hmm. and she she can't be around. I mean, the way I interpret it is that she she's not healthy enough to be around her child, I guess is what she's saying. And, or is, uh, the, is the idea that she's like, I mean, it's fairly open for interpretation, right? Is it the idea that everything in LA makes me think of this traumatic experience? Or the other way I looked at that was her saying he could be around any corner. I don't know what she means by what she's saying in that sentence. I, I think either of those could have been interpreted there. Right, right. So I thought that was interesting. Um, I wanted to look at a little bit more. Of course, it's a two-hour, um, it's a two-hour segment, and there were some other parts that I thought 
you know, again, if you're looking at this from the perspective I am, then all of it just seems, you know, mind boggling. But, uh, but we look at uh, one other part here. Oh, we've got a, sorry, a super chat. Yep. Vanessa V, $5 says, Colonel, remember the Green Day video, Wake Me Up When September Ends? It's crazy to see that video now on YouTube. <laughs> Jamie, that's right. Jamie and Evan met on that video. She talks a little bit about that in Phoenix Rising in the HBO documentary that she did. Another reason to be that I'm skeptical of anyone is if you have the institutional power to have a documentary made about you <laughs> and, to inf in, and to influence legislation, Right. I just maybe it's my natural distrust of authority in such things, or natural distrust of political authority, of organized authority as such, that I tend to be very, very, I question. I tend to question. Yeah, I think that that's definitely legit. Okay, so we'll watch this for just a bit and see what see what y'all think. Oh, watch out! We got an ad. I hate the ads. Oh my gosh! Dun dun dun. Okay. Here we go. Carol spoke about this a bit um, in Catch and Kill, and that it wasn't just about Weinstein. It was also sort of uncovering like a mass conspiracy to protect predators oh, and, and, and high, high profile ones. I totally ones. agree with that. Yeah. And I think that yeah. is absolutely a thing. And I, But you said something very important, which was me having to sort of... I just wanted to point out because people criticize, sometimes they criticize my edits and like I'm not the best editor in the world, particularly on interviews when I'm trying to just churn them out fast. But there are some really rough, <laughs> rough edits in this. <laughs> anyway, it's all right. Give myself to detach from things that might have been important to me if I'm either going to speak out or show up the way I want in this situation. So you spoke out. What was his reaction to you speaking out? Brian's? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not... So, well, first I was speaking out um, without naming him. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was trying to say it was other people in my life and kind of like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, well, she told me about so and so, or it must have been this person mm. or that person, and then I he started getting questioned about it because mm. people were mm -hmm. kind of putting two and mm -hmm. two together, um, and ended up hanging up on the on the interviewer because mm -hmm. they were getting a little a little too close, um, and that sort of caused a, a bit of an uproar. So I know he was just trying to kind of downplay it at first, um, and then we, uh, you know, me and 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 a, a few other survivors came forward. And the first thing I noticed was he started setting up the narrative uh, with some of the words he used, like, these are horrible distortions of reality and whatever I've done, it's been with you know like-minded partners or things like that. So I immediately understand, like, okay, he's already setting this up that these were all consensual interactions and we just maybe misunderstood or got in over our head. And because he's a powerful man who has built a career off of being shocking and disturbing yeah. is going to get away with it because his right to being weird and kinky will get defended in court yeah. and we will get shamed for ever even stepping foot mm -hmm. in there or participating. And so it's been used a million times. Hours after um, publicly named Brian as her alleged. <laughs> Go ahead. Her, uh, her, it's funny that she mentions his uh, use of certain words because she's doing the same thing. Um, using the word survivors when mm. uh is is very clearly designed to evoke emotion the same way she's saying he's doing with certain language um i do wonder for the like i would be interested to know whether the lady doing the interview would go into an interview with marilyn manson with the same open mind or does she have to just kind of make an assumption off the bat that I guess this is the person whose side. That's why I have such a hard time with cases like this, right? Like, would she treat Marilyn Manson with the same level of uh, respect where she's uh, kind of mirroring, mirroring. Yeah. Her, agreeing. Right? Yeah. So, so agreeing like g given that she wasn't there and she can't know for sure, would she be willing to give Marilyn Manson that same benefit of the doubt for the sake of moving the interview forward? Right, right. And, you know, I mean, who knows, but uh, I, I'm I'm somewhat dubious, obviously, personally. Okay, I wanted to skip ahead just a little bit here. 
she has these kind of awkward pauses where she gives these uh like def these definitions related to narcissism it's a little odd but i guess it's informative i don't know <laughs> Dr. Drew here. There is something I came across recently. Uh, Dr. Drew, I, uh, I'm i old enough to remember the old love line. So am I. I remember love line. <laughs> Says things for him. He's kind of fallen away. And I think it's the only oh, reason okay. why it's, oh. it's... There's just a little bit here. This was something she said that I was... Little... My intimate relationships have always been entirely consensual with like-minded partners, regardless of how and why... Others are choosing. She's reading Marilyn Manson's statement here. The music's kind of odd in the background. <laughs> yep. To misrepresent the past. That is the truth. But there were people popping up on the internet that were saying there were minors. And I was like, well, how are you going to defend that? You're, you know, you mm -hmm. can't say that those mm -hmm. things were consensual. And more stories started popping up and slowly he stopped talking. He just stopped talking completely. And now his lawyer just kind of. So I don't like what came, the way what that. What came of those claims? What's that? What came of those claims? Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff here that she's either mischaracterizing or she's simplifying, which again, it's like you're talking about how you don't, you're very reluctant to buy into any particular narrative. And I think that's, that's right. So first of all, she says that, uh, that Manson he stopped talking because there were these minors coming out to these stories coming out about things he had done with minors. Well, Manson, you know, he never, he's never talked. He made one statement the day that Evan Rachel Wood and all of these other women came out and posted their stories on their Instagram mm -hmm. uh, that day, or maybe it was the day after, I think it was later that day, but Manson made one statement, just one, he, he, presented, put out, I guess through his publicist or uh, on Instagram or whatever, he, one statement. And it was just what she read there, said everything's always been consensual. This is a horrible distortion of reality, et cetera, et cetera. And then he's never spoken since. The only, the only speech that we've gotten from Manson has been in legal declarations, so to speak. Okay. And so that's a mischaracterization. I don't like that. She's acting like he got, he, 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 well, he first, he tried to speak for himself and then he got all scared when these minors were popping up and he just faded away. It's not what happened. Now, as far as far as what she's referring to, um, there's actually only been one person that has gone on record uh, alleging that anything happened when she was a minor. And it, <clears throat> it, it is a lawsuit that was filed by a woman named Bianca Kine. And her problem, as I've talked about a lot on my channel, her problem is that the law, the things that she is alleging in the lawsuit are very, very different. It's a very different story than the story that she gave when she did this long two hour podcast uh, about Marilyn Manson and her experiences with Marilyn Manson. So in 2021, when all of these women came out on Instagram, including Evan Rachel Wood, this woman, this Bianca Kine woman, she did an extensive uh, set, uh, podcast interview and also <laughs> did some interviews with the Sun magazine, but she did a, an hour and a half uh, two hour podcast interview where she alleged specifically that nothing happened between her and Manson when she was underage, except a kiss on the, on the lips that she said lasted. I think she said it lasted like one second. Like she even said that. Did and he so, know how, she, what, how old she was at the time? Or is it, did this happen like a party or something? It was, it, she's alleging that it was uh, after a concert and it was on, it was on the tour bus. And so, and so no, her, um, her, her beef with him is that they, well, at the time in, in this interview, her beef with him was that they, you know, they just should have been more, the, the guys should have been more, you know, cognizant of the fact that these, these women looked young or were young. Uh, but she only alleged in that initial podcast interview that he, the worst thing he did was he, he kissed her on the lip. She said for, she said something like literally one second and that was it. Well, then what happened was when she filed her uh, lawsuit several months ago, suddenly in the lawsuit, she's alleging actual sexual assault that took place. She alleges when she was underage. And so she's completely added yeah. this whole sexual assault episode. And so that's the problem that you get into, I've found not all, but with a number of these Me Too accusations against a number of these famous guys is that when you actually look into it, these people, they've contradicted themselves flatly or you have huge character issues. Let me read to you something that Jamie Bell wrote about Evan Rachel Wood. This was in a legal declaration that he filed uh, in the Tennessee courts. And um, 
and this is what he's, this is Jamie Bell talking about Evan Rachel Wood. He said, I would also like the court to know that Evan's recent behavior with Jack is truly alarming. Uh, he says, during a FaceTime call I had with Jack, he said something to the effect of, you're not good, daddy. You're not here. It broke my heart. A few weeks earlier, Jack told me he drew a picture of a man who has been hurting him. Evan jumped onto the call and corrected him, saying, not the man hurting you, the man hurting me. Jack told me that the man's name is Brian, Marilyn Manson's real name, and he lives three miles from my house, this is Jamie Bell talking, in Los Angeles, and that's why Jack was staying in Nashville. Um, and then he, then he goes on to complain about the fact that Evan is refusing to return Jack to California due to this, this pretext, he says, of supposed abuse by Manson. Um, and so, so then he continues, though. He says, I, I know Evan loves our son, but I am very concerned by how she is handling the current situation. Whatever fears she may espouse regarding third parties should have nothing to do with me or the custody of our son. I do not even want to think of the short and long-term psychological harm Evan is inflicting upon Jack with this kind of talk and with my prolonged separation, I worry now that Evan is alienating me from Jack, even inadvertently. I simply want to normalize things for our son and have him in Los Angeles. And then it goes on and on. And later he, he says flat out, I'm begging the court to intervene. Um, and, you know, so you've got stuff like this. And I know that it's not determinative. You know, it's possible that she could be playing these games with uh, with Jamie Bell, but also that uh, that Manson, you know, could have abused her. But then you look at the fact that she did things like she she faked an FBI letter, yeah. uh, submitted that in family court. And also the fact that you we have someone who has gone on record, Ashley Morgan Smithline, who was one of the women that was originally involved in this whole um, in this whole uh, these this this set of allegations with Evan Rachel Wood. So Ashley Morgan Smithline was on the cover of People magazine. She came out and accused Manson, and she was one of the main women who accused Manson. So here you see this is like it's like an iconic uh, photo now. People magazine. I survived a monster. So that woman, Ashley Morgan Smithline, she came out in a legal declaration. You know this, I know, months ago, and this was not just an interview. It was a legal declaration. The weight of the law and perjury, and and she claimed in this legal declaration that uh, she had lied, that Manson had not abused her, and that Evan Rachel Wood had pressured her to lie as a part of this hoax to get more attention. So you know, there's just too many. I think there's just too many problems to ignore, and so that's why when I look at an interview like Evan Rachel Wood did with Dr. Romani, um, it's. I, I don't know. It's it, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> when there's that many questions, it makes it very hard for people to know who to believe and like. And I think that for the most part, a lot of people, the general instinct is I still think predominantly from a lot of men, ones that aren't aware or aren't paying attention super closely to what's going on here. That instinct by men to be protective of women and what women may experience in the world is extremely deeply felt. And the, the ter most terrifying part of that concept is the idea that if that is true and she knows that and she's being dishonest on purpose while taking advantage of the fact that the average human instinct is to protect a woman who's going through something awful, that's really, really bad. Right. You don't want to imagine that someone would use such a, you know, such a thing against someone. But I don't know. It's just uh, when there's that many questions, it's very hard for the average person who isn't going to take in all this information, who isn't going to remember the names of all the people involved, who isn't <laughs> aware of everything that's happening. When there's that many questions, you are going to end up falling into two camps. And unfortunately, I think he loses in, in, in both respects. I think you either fall into the camp of uh, – and this, what I'm saying here is for the people who don't look super closely right? They're going to fall into one of two camps. They're either going to say, my instinct says to protect the woman involved. So I'm going to take her word for it because that's what society is. It's how I've been programmed by society and, and through, you know, we are genetically predisposed to wanting to protect women. You're either going to fall in that camp or you're going to be somebody who's gonna be like, look, I don't know. I, I don't care. It sounds hinky, but I'm not sure. 
I don't know. I don't think he wins in either of those cases. The people who look closely are the ones who are going to support him. The one, the people who look extremely diligently at all the information are the one that are going to are the ones that are going to support him. But when it comes to just the people who are either just out there to looking at the base level of information, most likely coming from mainstream news sources, sure. I feel like unfortunately he ends up losing out because people are either they get they hear a little bit to the contrary, they say, "Yeah, well, I don't know what to believe." And it's like, it's a mess. It's a mess. Yeah, it's a mess. It's like, that's what I'm saying, right? Yeah. So I think that he only has one real course of, re, uh, one real recourse to that, and that's the people who are very, very committed to looking through these stories very deeply and are extremely opinionated, and that's hard. It is. It is. And, you know, the challenge that I've faced as someone who has really been trying to for for two, you know, over two years, almost two and a half years now, been trying to raise awareness of this as, as you know, the, I don't have time to look into like 0.01 percent of all the Me Too cases out there. But this is one that from the very beginning I, I started looking into and I really believe. I really believe that this guy is the victim of a hoax, not that he's never done anything dishonorable or disreputable in his entire life, but that but that I do not believe that he did these things, that he is this monster he's accused of. And I think that there's a lot of deception going on here with these women. But the challenge is to get to get the word out on that and to make that something that people feel compelled to care about because yeah. he's not cuddly Johnny Depp. At least that's not his yeah. perception. <laughs> they, but that's another thing. She, she made the point in that interview talking about how his, uh, he was using his uh, reputation or his image as uh, you know, somebody who's uh, alternative, right? What, I don't remember what the word she used for it was, but right. she said that he was using that to his advantage. I would argue that, the framing that they're doing uses his past image to their advantage just as much. It definitely does. It's definitely, we're definitely seeing the, uh, the flip side of, uh, of a coin on this in terms of it's, it's turned that, that image is definitely uh, turned yeah. to his detriment. Now I think, you know, what I'm hoping is that as more and more, um, false Me Too cases are exposed, or at least as we see more and more to make us, to, to create doubt within us, just like what's going on with Trevor Bauer. We'll talk about that in a second. But as we see more of these cases that, that where it's clear there's a reason to doubt, then I, I my hope is that people get a general sense of frustration with this with this kind of stuff and, and become much more resistant to cancellations so that the next time we have a Marilyn Manson situation come up where no one has actually been criminally charged with anything, where people will say, you know what, he he doesn't, his record label doesn't have to yeah. fire him. His, his manager or whatever doesn't have to fire him. He doesn't have to go away, you know, that sort of thing. Like maybe if we could start, if society could start kind of shrugging this off more, but I think the only way you make that happen is you raise awareness. Like people have to be yeah. aware, first of all, that things like this are happening, or at least that's my perspective. I, don't I, I tend to feel like that, like it, I, I would love that. Maybe I'm just less optimistic about the human condition <laughs> at times, but I tend to think that what ends up happening instead of people becoming um, inquisitive, I don't think that that's the human. I don't think that that is the natural reaction. I think the pendulum swings very far the opposite way. And then we just fall into a cycle where nobody believes anybody. And I think that's, that's actually going on a fair amount now too. People that may will be just healthier though. Maybe just complete just mistrust. Me. Yeah. <laughs> like people will just dismiss the, but that's not distrust. That's, that's actually dis like, like it's distrust of what they're saying, I suppose. But it's, it's a lot of it is like, they just dismiss it out of pocket now and just say, it's not true without mm -hmm. looking into it. Just like before people would just say it must've happened. Why would they lie? Mm -hmm. and don't look into it now it's going to go the opposite direction now yes that for for the cases in which people are falsely accusing someone for the for the benefit of raising their social status or financial benefit that's great because it discourages people from doing that unfortunately as we know what that also does is makes it harder on the ones that actually do fall prey to these types of cases and the sad fact of the matter is is that in hollywood this behavior is prevalent and the people who benefit the most from people's distrust of these things of a hoax uh, like this, as you're saying, are the studio executives who, who do stuff like this are the ones who got away from it when Weinstein got caught. 
Mm-hmm. It's not like this stuff like Hollywood has. It's it's why I find this stuff so fascinating because Hollywood has puts you through this pipeline, right? You're a young woman in Hollywood. You're go, you go in, you're expected to celebrate your sexuality and be openly and outwardly. Um, either if not, uh, extremely sexual, if not like, uh, like lean into like nympho, like into almost <laughs> nymphomania, right? That's right. how they're expected to be. In Highly their 20s. sexualized. Yeah. That's yeah. how they're supposed to be in their twenties. Then they eventually have their rebirth in their thirties. The musicians do it when they make their serious album. And then they, uh, and it's something like what happened with Kesha, right? She, she goes through what she went through. She goes through a imagery branding and it's almost like we've turned the victimhood, the, the real victimization of some people and the fake victimization of other people into a rebrand for people. Mm-hmm. And if mm-hmm. that's not the most cynical way to look at the idea of sexual assault, I don't know what is. But when it comes to cases like this, the people who end up benefiting the most are the studio executives, are the ones who can control whether these stories get to the paper or not. Look at what happened with the reporter who got caught on a hot mic saying that she had a whole story about Epstein, but then the network quashed it said can't run it right Mm -hmm. those people aren't going to get caught those people are never going to get caught because the system won't allow it so it's like we're so we've become distrustful of other people we've encouraged people to uh we've encouraged monetarily people to flaunt victimhood whether true or not and i think society loses on every level and the studio exec executives and the record executives and the people with actual institutional power uh, I, I will make the caveat that I'm sure there's plenty of 80s rockers that are shaking, shaking in their boots most of the <laughs> time. I'm sure most of them have news alerts set up on their phones. Oh, my God. <laughs> to, like to, to double check to try and get ahead of it. Right. Dude, that would be me. That would be me if I were uh, if I were a rock star, you know, male rock star with the yeah, with the. Uh, well, like if, a Mick Jagger, one of those, man. Any if, the, day now. if you were if you were famous in an era where women destroyed the ozone layer with with hairspray, <laughs> you're terrified every single day of oh what might God. come out and what might be reframed. Oh, man. All right. So we got uh, the Richard uh, is giving us a super chat, says Aloha, Colonel and Brett. Love your shows together. Send you an FM message for later. CK. All right. Thank you. And let's see. I think we've got I don't even know what an FM message is. What is I think it meant DM. I think it meant DM. Oh, maybe you hit. I don't know what FM is. Are you going to come from my radio? (laughs) I'm a boomer (laughs) now. I I don't know. I have no idea. I just assumed it was DM. It was like, whatever. It sounds good. Okay. I think that's all the super chats. There we go. Um, What? That's it. Come on, guys. <laughs> That's funny. Didn't mean no, like you know what it is? They're mad at me. They're like, take a stand, will you, coward? That's what they're saying right now. Oh, uh, I don't. But you know what? Take like, a apathy... fine. I'll, I'll, I'll just be like, fine. I believe Evan Rachel would, no matter what. She's right. <laughs> Whatever she says, I, I'm just going to take it as the truth because she's a woman. And why would a woman lie? I can't imagine. You know, what's funny about that, though, is that that was basically the attitude that (laughs) with a straight face, you could say something like that, like even like six years ago or whatever. So I I don't know. But um, I think I do feel like we are just awash in these now. Like there's no way that I can even start to keep up with with them. So like for the vast majority of these cases, I take I take the same view that you do. I I am always going to be adamant about the presumption of innocence and that if we're we're going to, if we're going to, if we're going to fail on one side or the other, right. Air, air on the side of that. And I I understand there's an argument for the opposite side, but to me, better, better that 10 guilty people go free than one innocent person spends a day in jail, as they say. And, and I agree with that. Some people don't, though. And that's an interesting conversation to uh, to have at some point. But I have to ask you, OK, there are two things that I've been seeing a lot about this week, and I'm totally not plugged into either of them. So Drew Barrymore was one of them. I feel like every couple of days I see something about how she's fucked up again or like the tables have turned. What's going on with her? She This she isn't said- even her fault. Like, OK, so so she made her thing right where she said that she was going to bring the show back. Uh, her her awful talk show that nobody watches. I'm sure I'm sure there's some suburban women who watch the show. I have no idea, but she was going to bring her show back. Um, unfortunately, what she didn't realize is that uh, one group I do have very strong opinions about is Hollywood unions, which have proven themselves to be abject bullies 
to be unbelievable. Oh, really? That's your right position. Now. So yes. you're oh, yes. you anti Hollywood unions? I'm yes, I am. I, I'm I'm anti. Um, uh, but the problem is, I'm just as anti studio because I think the studios are <laughs> awful too. So so again, um, you're just wishy washy. No. They no, they deserve each other. Is my stance. Burn <laughs> okay. it all down. That's fine, right? So basically, so she was going to bring the show back, and they were like. The, the people she worked for, she got a night letter. She had a, a knife tacked to her door with some letter that said, you better change your mind or else, which is what they do. They strike fear in your heart. It's like and she old, gave like, this, Jimmy Hoffa stuff. She gave it. this tearful apology, absolutely apologizing and denigrating herself for daring to do something as awful as cross the picket lines to bring back her stupid show that nobody wants to watch anyways. She was literally <laughs> in tears, right? All because she was going to go against the union's wishes. And so now the, the bad timing for her was like after making that, then like literally two weeks, a week and a half later, the strike ends for writers. Now, her top three writers, her three head writers, these women all decided to virtue signal and say, sorry, we're not coming back, which proves that it was never about collaboration. It was never about actually getting back to work. It's about virtue signaling so that you can make yourself look good for your union. Those three women will then likely find work on some other awful talk show that nobody watches. And I am of the opinion that of an entire industry, an industry full of activists at every level, there is probably... I would say that your average network or cable talk show writer is even worse than your average television show writer because you have a more and, – and probably just in, in even less talented, if that's even possible, because they have a more direct line – into the public consciousness than the writer does, right? A writer has to write their crappy, veiled um, social justice garbage into their television shows. And back in the day, it worked because it would it was it was deftly put into the stories. Obviously, in the last 10 years, we've realized that they don't even really do that well anymore. But what about the ones who don't even want to be able to do that? What are the ones who just want to be able to go into reach into your television box and tell you what to think? It's your writers for the view. It's your writers for the Drew Barrymore show. It's your writers for all of these ones for suburban women. What do to writers put on even doing... do? What do, uh, what do they even do? Are you telling me that like that that crap that comes out of Drew Barrymore's mouth is scripted? Someone's writing. Not that? necessarily. Okay, so so a lot of it would go into like a, a lot of these shows. Like if you watch something like The View, the writers would end up being the ones to figure out what they're going to help figuring out what they're going to talk about them and the producers. Okay, talking okay. points. Uh, okay. People will go through talking points stuff like that. But also like on on late night shows it's the ones who design the awful skits that mm. you have to watch and things like that and <laughs> yeah, those, okay. those writers have a more direct line into their into the viewers minds because they're literally able to just tell them what to think here talking head here talking head person that is put in front of the camera say this right mm -hmm. and then and then they get to then pass that message on to the audience i i actually might hate them more then I hate the average like movie writer. Like I can just not watch the movies or, or these talk shows, but the talk shows are always going to have an audience much like see Remember how they used to call CNN, like the airport news network, like nobody watched it, but it was always mm -hmm. on at the airport, mm -hmm. right? Like the average suburban mom might not care deeply about the view. But they're going to have it on in the background while they're, mm -hmm. while they're folding. Sure. And there are people who, there are a lot of people who hate watch the view too. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, we got into that earlier this week with on, on a couple of other subjects about the idea of hate watching stuff. I'm not oh, a you huge did? fan. Yeah. I don't like the idea of, and it's not about giving them money. Thank it's it's not about like it's not about giving them money because I like I can make the excuse that because it's my job, like I get to I get to talk. I, it's my job to talk about this stuff, so I consume the content. Mm -hmm. But I don't like the idea of hate watching stuff because life's too short. <laughs> it, no, it, I'm serious. We we hate watch. We we reviewed the show Velma, and I almost it broke me. I was I was it affected me mentally for like a couple of weeks because I just I, I would have to watch really? this, and then I would have to go on the show, and I am not exactly what you would consider a super angry person. I'm not, but mm -hmm. watching rabid, angry, bitter feminism portrayed in a cartoon that's uh, that's that's been marketed towards kids even though it's an adult cartoon that just it becomes the worst of what we have become as a culture the corporate culture of pushing ideology for money through a corporate structure right it's one thing if if somebody wants to do that on their own right but there's something even more insidious and evil to me at the idea of it being 
approved up the chain of command from a from a supposedly profit seeking entity that's proving to you when they put this garbage out that what they care about is promoting a, a certain ideology rather than making money and mm -hmm. all of that stuff is just awful so i was i was thinking about the fact i've never even heard of this velma is that what it's no, called yes it was a it was a big you, you should be happy that you don't um <laughs> well you uh, said it was excruciating i'm kind of intrigued now i'm like do i need to check this out you said it broke you I want to it was say. a spin-off <laughs> it's a spin-off of scooby-doo okay without scooby-doo okay and it's it's unbelievably hateful the humor is wannabe edgelord humor from like 2010 that's just not funny because we don't live in a climate where that's funny anymore. There was uh -huh. a time when that type of humor worked. Is it, oh, um, it's, it's Velma or Thelma? Velma. V E is in oh, Velma. Victor. Okay, yeah, okay, Velma. Okay, it's, it's, it. it's Velma Dinkley from And who is it? To, to whom is the hate directed? You said it's hateful. So it's, what, it's hateful towards men. It's hateful towards uh, straight okay. people. It's hateful towards everyone. It's, uh, okay, it's, not, okay. it's even in, in a lot of ways, it's hateful towards women. It's self hating. Oh, they took uh, an annoying uh, female character from Scooby Doo, and they made a yes. whole thing about her. Oh, okay. Well, Hold they what, the, what they did is they make her the head of the Scooby Gang, and they re and they re uh, and they rewrite history on it. Velma but, took over the Scooby Gang. Yes, uh, uh -oh. uh, it's a it's a prequel, and they make her and they make her fat and Southeast Asian, and uh, it's what? just awful <laughs> because no, because they turned it into a self insert because Mindy Kaling plays her. Okay, okay. <laughs> The point is, is that it's it. hateful. the show is hateful and I don't, I don't have time or inclination for overtly hateful stuff. It's funny. Mm -hmm. I talked to a friend mm -hmm. who sent me a message. He's a good friend of mine. He's a movie. He, he loves movies and he saw the creator and he says, look, he's okay. He's like, I didn't see the same thing you did. I didn't like it. And he points out, he goes, look, there was overt communist propaganda in there. And I said, where? Like, I didn't see it. Right. But the mm -hmm. point being that once he pointed it out to me, what he pointed out to me in the movie was anti-American and in a way pro-communism. But the thing is, I didn't notice that, which is a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm not so ideologically inclined that I don't think you can't tell good movies that have a message that I disagree with. It just better be done in a way that's entertaining and doesn't seem overt, right? Mm -hmm. So him mm -hmm. pointing that out to me, I'm like, oh yeah, that's kind of true. doesn't ruin how I feel about the movie, but it was done in a way that put the movie first, not the, not the bullshit. So yeah, that stuff that those, I can't hate watch, man. I can't hate watch stuff. <laughs> we did, we did rings of power too. That just like every time we we'd watch something on rings of power, I'd be like, but at least the CGI is good. I define something to not make me miserable. And when you're and when your job has you watching stuff like this and you're dreading doing it. Yeah. That's yeah. sad. That's sad in its own right. Right. Like that something that used to be to make you happy is now something you dread having to do. And that's awful. Oh, the violins are playing. They're playing. No, yeah. I have to. Well, you know, with this Manson stuff, a lot of what I'm doing is hate watching. Like basically everything that uh, <laughs> basically everything that Evan Rachel Wood uh, puts out there related yeah. to this case. I uh, but but actually, though. It's it's hate watching, I guess, but I, I think a more correct term sometimes would be that I'm just sort of awestruck. And I know that sounds weird, but there's sometimes when I will watch believing that that it is a hoax, as I do personally, and that she's she's lying or she's completely delusional. I will watch Evan Rachel Wood sometimes on these interviews, and I'm really just kind of like awestruck because, uh, you know, by and large, sometimes she, she doesn't do such a great job. Like on The View, she uh, <coughs> kept like touching her neck and stuff, obviously uncomfortable because Manson sued her that day. But like, you know, like on this program or Phoenix Rising, very convincing, very believable, all the permutations of emotion and the tucking the hair back and the tears at the right moment and all of that. And I'm just kind of like, wow, this is really effed up. But I can see, though, if you're watching Velma or like some kind of annoying animated bullshit, yeah. like it's just not. Um, I Speaking of being able to enjoy communist propaganda, <laughs> no, Marxist propaganda, yeah. uh, I always thought that the Justin Timberlake movie in time was great, was a great, had a, was great uh, Marxist propaganda, apart from the fact that I enjoyed the film. Did you ever see that? I Do didn't you know see concept? it. I know, what, I know what it is, but I never saw it. So the concept, just really quick, and then we'll, uh, and we'll break and come back. But uh, the concept of it was in the future that instead of having currency, 
people pay in lifespan because there's there's basically it's oh. like a Brian Johnson world and they've they found a way for wealthy people to live forever, right? If they if if you have enough of this currency, so to speak. And so what's interesting about it is that it really makes you think about the idea of wealth inequality. And I'm saying this as someone who's like a very Adam Smith capitalism oriented, whatever, right? I don't believe in in, in Marxist ideology on the whole, but I do think that I do think that being aware of the fact that we do have large wealth disparities that that's that is a that there's nothing wrong with that and that's a responsible way of of looking at the world and I thought it was really interesting to take the idea of wealth inequality and and bring it down to something that was very in your face which is actually lifespan inequality yeah. that literally the difference between rich and poor is that you had these this small group of rich people who were living for hundreds of years looking just perfect and pristine while the rest of society is out there you know living 10 20 30 years and dying do. yeah, making do with what they got and th there's an interesting cut like correlation there between the idea of talking about working your life away right yes yes uh and what's funny about that too is like look those stories can be great right there's there's nothing wrong with telling a story like that i do think that right now uh, on the macro scale is like, I see a lot of what's going, did you see the video that kind of went viral this week? I think it was, um, Isabel Brown or something like one of these conservative, they look like they come off an assembly line. They're, I'm sure they're very nice people, but like the, the, so this girl's watching this video, um, of like the, the cost of living, like the rent that people pay, like that Gen Z is paying versus like the stagnant wages. Right. Mm -hmm. And it shows you very clearly that the world we live in is is becoming more and more rigged every day that the that the idea that you're going to buy a house for most people is now out of reach mm. for most people it's going mm -hmm. to be out of reach uh and me and mary get into that a lot because we talk about how i think that in a lot of ways that has affected uh gen z because uh it's making them extremely doomer it's making them mm. nihilistic and it's like why would i try why fall in love and get married if i can't live in a house with with my family mm -hmm. why 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 fall in love and get married anyways because the because the world's coming to an end in 10 years because uh, alexandria ocasio cortez said so and the problem is i think that so it's been pushed through hollywood that uh wealth inequality is this big problem oddly it's always hypocritical and ironic right because it's coming right <laughs> the most hyper capitalist industry we have right in industry, or at least it was at one point and then also the notion that for them to, for, for like when people point this out and they get mad at the boomers and I get it, right? I get the reason why you're mad they effed everything up. I said, do you think that that's going to make these kids more free market? No, because they've been sold a lie as to what the free market is because we don't even live in a free market economy. We live in a mixed economy at best with tons of regulation. It's not going to make them more free right. market. It's going to make them more communist. It's going to make them search to the government, like look to the government for more fixes to their problems. And if there's one thing that I do believe Hollywood has done very, very well in their in their uh, covertly is they have made a lot of movies and a lot of television shows that do two things. They push the idea that the ends justify the means. And they're also they tend to be very pro government, but mm -hmm. it's a very pro liberal gov what they call a liberal government. And I think that that comes out. No, there's a lot of appeal to authority in a lot of movies and stuff that come up. Maybe it's just the stuff that I watch. Well, right? I think, okay, so I, I think that I, I see a lot of anti-government stuff too, like with the Hunger Games movies. But, but I, where I'll agree with you, though, is I see many movies that have to me a, a more of a a marxist perspective of like you know evil rich people and we need to like overthrow the they don't system like the rich and people. we need they, to they, do this right that's right. what's funny about it right they're very anti-rich person but well, self-loathing is a very yeah. deep psychological perspective and yeah. look i think this is what happens when people break into hollywood or when people have in, in these in these environments they have a lot of of wealth and also when they live in a world of artificiality which is what hollywood is i think mm -hmm. that 
I think that uh, it really does create this split within them because on the one hand, as any of us would, they enjoy the the perks and the fame and the glamour and the luxury and all of that. And I would be the same way. But on the other hand, there's, there's a part of them though, that, 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 it, that recognizes the emptiness of it. And also the fact that they are, they are very, they're living exceptional lives. They're like the top 0.0001%. And you've got all of these people underneath it, who are, who very, degrees of suffering right so to speak and so i think that that's hard i mean that's hard for me to deal with at times yeah. like thinking about how great you and i have it yeah. compared to 99.9 percent .9 of humans throughout history i mean that's mind-boggling so i can see where like the guilt comes from and i can see where the the marxist perspective comes from and look in a perfect world where human beings um where human beings uh are are not flawed and they don't require uh personal or individual incentives to produce. I actually, mm. I think that, yes, the, the communal perspective is a more moral one. Like there isn't a reason yeah. why someone should have, and if I think about it in a very just purely yeah. ethical sense, there is no reason why one person should have a billion dollars, another person not. But the problem is that capitalism, I believe is still the best of all possible shitty systems. And until we move on to something else, or maybe we have a technological revolution that makes work obsolete or whatever, I, this is the best we got. I feel like, I don't the, know. The idea that you can, like, the example I will always point out, first of all, I'm also going to talk about this thing from Victoria Beck Beckham in a second, but okay. So okay. the idea, like if you've got two kids, how often do those kids end up in identical circumstances? If your own parents can't raise two people hmm. to end up with equal outcomes, the idea that we will ever be able to create a society, anything that involves free will to come to equal outcome is beyond utopian. And I'm, I'm actually, I don't take, have strong opinions on a lot of things, but I do believe that the individual is where the focus should be because I one, agree. I believe that when we, it's, it's like the George Carlin skit, right? He says like, I love people, but as soon as they start forming groups, even as little as two, yeah. you see a vast difference in how human beings behave. And I'm just, yeah. I'm never going to look at that as the ultimate solution. Not so long as free will is a choice, but as far as the Holly is, as long as free will is the, you're talking is, about, I just want to say you're, you're, you're talking about the dark side of groups in the sense that when they form groups, then you have this, the, now this opening for authoritarianism and conflict and things like that. And yeah, and, I mean, not just not not just conflict, but yeah, struggles for power, right. struggles for resources. Right. Look at, like, th there's a reason why they say that a hippie commune works up to about 50 people. And then once you get past a certain amount, too many, too many group dynamics come into play and make it impossible. So the idea of doing that on the macro scale of mm -hmm. entire populations without the, either the threat of physical force of physical force, the withholding of resources, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's, I think it's a bit ridiculous, but Hollywood's going to continue to push that idea because they feel guilt. Did you see the clip of David Beckham and Victoria Beckham, where she tries to tell this interview for netflix about how her dad grew up how she grew up working class i and have seen it but it's have, funny okay. i tell let's, you what let's take a five minute yeah. break and i'll yeah. i'll pull it up because it's actually funny to see it i'll pull it up and then we'll yes. come back and talk about it okay, okay. all right yep. everybody we'll be back in uh in five minutes
Okay, I found it. Um, let's Got it. See. One second. I want to recognize a couple of super chats. Chelsea McClellan, thank you for that super chat earlier. I put it up on screen, but I forgot to call it out. Thank you for that. High Voltage 75, thank you for the 20. Is that one of your people? Oh, yes, it is. High Voltage, how you doing? <laughs> well, he or she left a nice message. I love the smell of napalm <laughs> in the morning. Yeah, it smells like victory. Here tonight, showing my support for the Colonel. Oh, hi, Brett. <laughs> well, like did he at least spell my name right? He spelled my name right, it looks like. <laughs> got, the, it's become a meme on the show that they, they, they spell my name wrong at every opportunity. Brent, Brent, Brett with one T, Brett with three E's. Literally any way but B-R-E-T-T. -T. Come on, guys. Well, I can sympathize with that with uh, Kristen. You know, I think that my name... K-R-I-S-T-E-N. I think that it's very straightforward and mm -hmm. should be easy. But I get when I when I give people that name, you know, anytime I'm asked to to put my name down mm -hmm. on something or fill out anything and people are like, Crystal, Christy, Kirsten, <laughs> Kirsten. Kirsten. I mean, I I've heard all 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 around the world, you know, all these different ones. And and very rarely do they just get it, you know, no, yeah. Kirsten. <laughs> my dyslexic ass would probably get Kirsten once. Would probably say Kirsten at least once. There are many variations. Kirsten, Kirsten, <laughs> Christian. So it all means basically Christian. it all means Christian, follower of Christ. <clears throat> so Kristen means follower of Christ, but uh but yeah, lots of variations. Okay, so I did find it. One second. So there's um. So for people who don't know, there's a big net. I haven't seen it. But there's a, a long, uh, a really big uh, Netflix series on the Beckhams, uh, Victoria and David Beckham. And I was never into soccer or football. Uh, I like American football, but I know he's huge, huge. Like some people worship him like a god or whatever. He was the of face of H and M for like a decade, wasn't oh, he? Oh yeah. I mean, like they're. They're worth hundreds of millions of dollars uh, from all of the the endorsements and everything that he's both of them have done. And of course, she was the hottest she, Spice Girl. She, I think. she was absolutely the hottest Spice Girl. I will I will not accept any slander that even dares to say that there was a hotter Spice Girl than Posh Spice. Everyone knows that. And let's face it, she really was part of one of the greatest scenes in cinematic history. When the Spice Girls saved us from an alien invasion in the movie Spice World, when the aliens come down. Did you see Spice World? Really? Oh, yeah. 12 year old Brett saw Spice World. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Multiple times. Multiple here, I've times. I've got a picture here. Yeah. So, Victoria Beckham, there is uh, Posh Spice. She's the one on the left. Yeah. I always thought People that have she no was. Idea why she's always doing this with her hands. <laughs> I never cared. So she married David Beckham and they had several kids and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But they got a series out. It's like a, bi you know, a, a documentary series on their lives. And uh, anyway, but there's this scene that some people are talking, talking you gotta about. You got to watch. You got to watch. It goes to what we're talking about, about struggle. You got to watch this. It's okay, incredible. One second. One second. I got it. I got it. I had it. I'm not a master at this uh, technology, but here it comes. Okay. All right. <laughs> it's so good. Here, let me rerun it. Here, okay. We're very working, working class. Be day. honest. I, I, Sorry, I'm one more time. Honest. You might have to turn it up, people. Sorry. We're very working, working class. Be honest. I, I am being Be honest. honest. I am being what honest. What did your dad drive me to school? <laughs> my dad did. No, why not? My dad. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right, it's a simple answer because. <laughs> It depends. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> My dad had a Rolls Royce. <laughs> it's very working class to own a Rolls Royce. Right. Now, from what I understand, he actually was working class growing up. So, like, it might it might bother him more to have somebody say that, you know, to have somebody wear the skin suit of the working class. <laughs> but it speaks to what, like, what Mary will say a lot of times is now, uh, like, hot women – are not allowed to just want to be hot anymore. Like you have to give an excuse, right? Like, like you're almost shamed for wanting to be attractive, right? And rich people aren't allowed to just be like, look, I grew up with a ton of money. Like, I'm sorry. Like, it, because there is such disdain for the wealthy in this country now, at least in America, right? So the idea that it's like a... Kim Kardashian, right? Like, or, Don, uh -huh. or even Don, like, or even think about Donald Trump, who, like, he did make something of himself. Yes, his dad gave him a million dollars, and then people would say, 
like, oh, yeah, well, his dad gave him all this money. I'm like, you do know that million and billion are like way different, right? <laughs> like that those aren't the same thing, right? There is there is a certain amount of disdain for people who come from a place of privilege these days. Right. And I find that funny because everybody out here is fighting among, amongst themselves and the rich people are trying to play themselves off as this, as if they're part of the working class because it's more beneficial for them socially to have overcome something because we are obsessed with victimhood. We are obsessed with the idea of people beating the odds, even if it's not the actual odds that they faced. Right, right. And I think that, uh, and I think that people, there is a, there is a sense today that uh, among a number of people that you should be ashamed or apologize for, or feel guilty for having a, a lot of money. Um, I, you know, I, I guess this is where, and this might sound like a cop out to people or ridiculous, but I guess this is where having a personal belief like I do in the, um, in the, the possibility of reincarnation or of some kind of life after death or even an afterlife, it, it, I guess that it gives me a different perspective on these things because I don't look at it as like this, this one life or this one earth yeah. is like a one shot deal. And if you have a crappy life, then, then, you know, then, then it's over for you. I, I guess that I see where probably we all in some sense get the, get the chance uh, at some point to be, wealthy and to be poor and all of that. And so I don't know, people say that's, that's crazy or that's a cop out and maybe it is, but, uh, but that's kind of the view that I take on these things. Um, and, but so you're going to, you're going to come back reincarnated as a very rich, uh, <laughs> very rich person. Well, you know, I mean, statistically and historically I am in my just rich by, incarnation, by in, oh, but also like just by being born in America, yeah, you, were born, you, were, you were born better off than like 99% of the world anyways. It's just that Americans love to bitch and complain all the time about everything. No, I mean, it would, I think it would behoove a lot of us to remember that not only being born in the country that we're in, but being born in the time period that we're in, yeah. that we are in the 0.00001% of humanity that has lived and so that's not, and that's not to make anybody feel guilty or to say well we shouldn't care about poverty or what have you but i'm just i'm just saying that it does give you a lot of gratitude and also a sense of proportion but uh you know something that i think is interesting and you probably i'm sure read this or heard this is that even though wealth inequality it is a definite problem and i i agree with that and i wish there weren't as much of a gap as there is if you look at over over the decades over the last like century or so or right is that um people are on the whole people are being lifted out of poverty and so it's there is a kind of a rising tide that has over the decades mm -hmm. lifted <clears throat> lifted all boats now it doesn't mean that there's not still terrible poverty but this idea that like and uh, that things are just getting worse and worse and worse that people feel or that uh, or that people are just hopelessly mired in poverty. I mean, there's no you're we're hopelessly mired in the fact that most people are going to be renters for the rest of their life. Oh, yeah. No, I wasn't talking about like what you you is in like, no, yeah, saying. I'm saying more of a just a sense of a kind of a just a, a horrible fatalism. Now, look, yeah. I get where it comes from, though. Did you see the video of and, and I know some people aren't going to like this. It's kind of political, but I just have to say, did you see the video of Biden today that was on it, tonight? It was the top story on the Daily Mail at his pre press conference. And mm -hmm. he just basically trailed off and just couldn't finish the train of thought. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, I was having this conversation with AJ, uh, one of my mods on here. We were talking about this because I said in a recent video that I understood why people are freaked out about the economy. And I did this video basically that I, I do like once a year asking for money, like reminding people to mm -hmm. or whatever. I don't know if your channel does that. Do you do tips or things like that? No, I mean, we like we most of our revenue comes from super chats from audience engagement with viewers like you remember channel <laughs> channel two. Yeah, so with, uh, we are we so we are we survive uh, with support from viewers like you. So that's uh, that's how it is for most of us. I mean, there's obviously revenue that comes from videos, but that's uh, 
That you probably at- get a lot of yours demonetized too when you're controversial though, like I do, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, also like we tend to like, like a big part of our show is like, like if it's, if, if Mary's out of town, it's just a discussion. Uh-huh. Mary loves the visuals. Mary wants to, Mary, Mary wants clips on screen. She wants to play, like we got to play all this stuff. And a lot of times if it's a clip from a television show or it's a clip from something that we're reacting to, you can't monetize those segments. So uh, that's right. You can't, you can't so well so anyway my point is that uh, that i did do this video basically that i do once a year asking for money uh, for tips what have you and one of the things that i said was that i realize that people are freaked out about the economy or yeah. and, and partly because and i said this i said because we have a senile president now i really wasn't meaning that to be like a big political stand that i was taking Ooh, you gotta be careful <laughs> with that one you gotta be careful with that one uh, people are touchy these days man so here's my question, though, okay, and this was something that, that AJ and I were talking about, but I just want to open this up to the floor, like to all my viewers. See, I thought that that was not a very political comment because I thought it was just obvious. So is it not obvious to everyone that we doesn't have matter. a president who's kind of shaky right now? I mean, that there's it something doesn't matter. No? It doesn't matter. Not, not in the hyper-polarized party, down party lines climate we live in now, where uh, it doesn't matter if he's old and senile and needs to be carted off in a wheelbarrow. He, <laughs> you, support, you support who you're supposed to support because that's what they tell you to do. Or because you really, not even so much that that's what they tell you to do, but because you've been propagandized to believe that the other side is the unique form of evil, rather than understanding but- that pol- politics as a whole tends to be evil. And, and I understand, I understand the, like the, the media propaganda and everything, but I'm asking you like on a more basic level mm-hmm. and people in the audience, is it, is it not obvious to everybody? And I mean, this like, this is not sarcastic at all. Okay. Is yeah. it not obvious to everybody? Have, have other people not seen these clips that I've seen where he's they don't see obviously him. like not all there or am I not, am I not seeing, am I not interpreting it correctly? Like, I don't know. The the thing is, is we are like, you're you're automatic. Like we're discounting the fact that by being people that work in media and around and in looking at this content all the time, you're taking in media that the average person who just wants to go to work, come home, make dinner for their family, and watch football. They're not seeing these clips. If they watch the news, they're watching, if they're watching it on YouTube, go look up, anything to do with politics on YouTube. You're not Mm going to see anything other than what they call authoritative news sources for the Mm -hmm. first two page, two pages, unless you go search for it. Do you think you're going to see any of those senile clips on a CNN YouTube video or on an MSNBC YouTube video? You might see it on a Fox video if they're, if they're trying to cover it. But even then, Like people are so polarized now that if you if you've been bred to believe that Fox is evil or you've been raised to believe that CNN is evil, most people aren't venturing outside of their echo chamber to look for news anyways. So it's the same thing is going to happen in four years or whenever there's a a Republican president again, there's going to be clips that are only going to be played to that audience and people are going to be generally more or less aware because they're not looking for that news. And I think that people take for granted the fact that when you're in this space, the average person just isn't really paying that close of attention. So I know people who legitimately believe the economy is fine, that Biden is a Catholic and the world is going great, that have no idea what's going on right now. Wait, and what What about Biden and Catholic? I they, think I missed out on that. I, I just had a, I just remember when I was, when I was talking to my old boss about 2020 and again, we're like, uh, not to make this a political show. It's no, it's, point, but you can right? say but what you want to say. No, it's the, fine. The it's point right. is, is like, she's like, he's a good Catholic. And I'm like, he believes in abortion and I'm not, and I'm not a pro-life person. I'm just like, I was like a good Catholic would like like they a lot of people on the other side wouldn't consider you a good catholic traditional catholicism it is it's very yeah. i guess it is very pro life right so okay. so right so it's like and and he's i was like and he's kind of senile and she's like i i haven't seen that i'm like well that's fine i don't expect you at that time i was very into politics i cared a lot about it at the time so i was privy to information because i was going and looking for it but mm-hmm. that's not who they're looking to court as a voter base they're looking mm-hmm. to court the average person who's too busy Busy to care and just wants to vote on what they think sounds good. I it, I think I think it's possible to. I was going to show a clip here, of Biden. I think that it's possible to that what I am interpreting 
maybe I I already have this notion that that I I've had for several years that there is something wrong with him cognitively because oh, yeah. I I saw some clips. He's and to me, old. And to me it, well, he's old, and and I saw some clips, and to me it looked like that he was. And so there it may be some reinforcement that's going <laughs> on. Like every time I see these, I'm filtering them through that. Yeah. But like here's a clip. So we're gonna watch this, and I'm 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 really not wanting it like to watch it. So like I mean we can laugh, but like I'm not trying to ridicule him. But like I'm I want to watch this, and then I'm really curious if people think maybe. I'm, I and others are reading too much into this. So this was the, at one point, this was the top story on the Daily Mail tonight. But, uh, but anyway, uh, he seems shaky to me. I don't know. Let's watch it and, and see. Maybe, okay. maybe I'm reading too much into it. All right. Here today by President, you started your remarks here today by saying it was good news today with the economic report. Why do you think most people still don't feel positive or feel good news about the economy? Well, first of all, you just heard the news today, too. They haven't heard it. I think the people, those 300 plus thousand people who got jobs feel better about the economy. I, look, I got to choose my words here. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Wait, wait, wait. You all are not the happiest people in the world. I mean, I'm following you so far. Reported. I mean it sincerely. It gets a more little. You get more legs when you're reporting something that's negative. I don't mean I don't mean you're picking on me. Or I'm just the nature of things. You turn on the television, and there's not a whole lot about what saves dog as he swims in the lake. Okay. You know? Okay. And, you, know, uh, you know, somebody pushed the dog in the lake. I mean, I I, I get it, but. If you just y'all, I mean, is it? I mean, it's, it's elder abuse, dude. No. <laughs> it's elder abuse. Look, look. But there were really, times. There's something going on there, though, right? I mean, that's not yeah, just being he, a little. Yeah, he's old, and he needs to nap like for 20 hours a day if he's gonna live. Like he, like, look. I used to do a. I I did a lot of things when I was younger that mm -hmm. um weren't good for you. Mm -hmm. That would sometimes perhaps keep you up for days at a time. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a point to this. And the point is, is oh, when to, yeah, no, once, you get, once you get to the, um, we'll call them energy drinks. How about that? Uh, like by the end of that period, you're basically dozing off like that mid sentence. That's because you've exert overexerted your body due to drug use. He has overexerted his body because he's eight thousand years old. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not hard to believe. Like the the thing is, is like when when he showed up at the debates last last time, and he uh -huh. actually had some energy. I hope that the CIA gives him the super drugs. Like, I, I don't want anybody to to be like, I feel bad for him because like, I mean, I, I don't because he's corrupt and he's kind of evil. No, but I know but, what you mean. Like, but, we don't want our president to be in bad yeah, shape. Would anybody want like in that this would be the same thing if if Trump got reelected and he just started trailing off there. I would ask the same questions like why this doesn't convey power. This no, doesn't convey it doesn't. authority. It, does it, not. it conveys uh, please, sir, you need to stay awake until the end, <laughs> and then you can go take a nap and eat your ice cream. This is not a part, this is not on party lines. No country should be electing someone of either party that looks sleepy all the time. You know, when you look at, uh, I went back and I, and I'm not going to call it up here and waste our time, but it, but I went back and I looked at video of him when he was Obama's running mate, because mm. I was a huge, and this is a conversation for another time, but I was a huge Obama supporter. I actually like went around every weekend and knocked on doors for Obama and made calls. And I was like yeah. one of those annoying people. But anyway, I remember loving Joe Biden during that um, that campaign because he was so feisty and he was so witty and sharp. And I know the guy has always had he, he's had some political mishaps throughout the years, but he was he he was sharp and he was feisty. And that's just a completely different person yeah. than we see before us now. And so here's my concern is that obviously it's not like you said, it's not it's it's not a great show of power for our president to um to basically i think maybe have people running things for him in absentia it's like an old roman it's like ancient rome you know where you'd have a senile emperor yeah. and then the people underneath are the ones really running the running the program and i don't think it's that's good but also i think that 
what's going to happen is that we're going to end up with President Kamala Harris. And I'm not saying that that's, you know, maybe some people think that that's a great outcome, but it's not what people are voting for. Like, I think people need to understand that when they vote for Joe Biden, they're voting for his vice presidential candidate. And and is that like the choice they want to make? I'm a Tulsi Gabbard fan. I will, I want Tulsi Gabbard to run for president. I think she's amazing and uh, whatever, but I don't think that's going to happen. She's an independent, so it'd be hard for her to win. So. Yeah. Yeah. I just like, I'm, I'm so jaded on all of it now. Right. It's, it's oh, all yeah. such a, it's all just such a shit show that I, uh, I love the meme after all the Lauren Boebert stuff came out that just showed it, it just showed a picture of her and AOC and said, let's just have these two women mud wrestle to figure <laughs> out which geriatric asshole ends up in office for the next oh four my years. God. All right, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'll see here. So speaking of uh, geriatric, <laughs> we got the opposite here. Look at how beautiful and vibrant my Tulsi oh, yeah. is yes no <laughs> i really She's am a Tulsi gabbard fan you know her weakness you tell me if you agree with this we'll talk about it some other time maybe but she um she is not she's not always the most passionate communicator but i feel like she's gotten a lot better like if you mm. watch her now on her like her instagram shows and whatever like and when she goes on cnn or fox or, or what have you like i feel like she's become a really effective communicator where maybe that was lacking years ago i would love to see someone like this so people tell me that you know oh you're just a trumper or you're you're anti-woman or this or that i just want you to understand like uh, and first and people shouldn't have to apologize by the way for nope. supporting trump so that's that's not the case but i want people to understand this is who my ideal candidate would be <laughs> Anyway. Look, here's the other thing. Like, what? Like, we're in a world now where anything that deviates from establishment line gets you labeled. So I'll never forget. This is one of those stories. Like, I have a couple of interesting stories about how things happened before I came out here. But I had a friend where, like, we, he, I knew better than to get into than to to argue about politics with them. I always knew better than to do that. Early on, I just didn't care enough to argue with them and didn't know enough about it to really care. As I became, as I got older and became more involved, I just held my tongue because uh, I just, it just wasn't, I didn't need to. Like a lot of those people would sacrifice their friendship with you mm -hmm. because of politics. I wasn't mm -hmm. ready to do that with them because I knew, yeah. but I just remember after like one of the primary debates, I was like, wow, Tulsi Gabbard had a lot of great things to say. And he's like, Donald Trump is an existential threat to this country. I'm like, <laughs> oh no. Oh, because she'd like, be splitting the vote or something. Is I, that what I, I have no idea. I, I'm just like, okay, like whatever. Like, I don't care. Like, it's just, you cannot fall. Like you have to fall in line now to whatever the, whatever the establishment says. But yeah, I would have been, uh, I, I, I'd have been a Ron Paul guy. Ron Paul. Oh, Oh, you know what? I, I'm going to have to pull it up, but we have here in my house, we have an autographed picture of Ron Paul because, awesome. because my guy used to be such a huge fan. So like Liberty. big libertarian. Yeah. Yep. No, we both honestly, like at our hearts, like we're both in our, like at our cores, we are both libertarians. And yep. I think that like, I just want most of the time, I just want people to leave me alone, honestly. <laughs> yep. oh, yeah. Well, you're not, you're not allowed to opt out anymore. Also, who right. else? Like, we, we covered this. We've, we covered a great conspiracy theory today. And by the way, thank you. Hi, thank yep. you. High voltage 75 for that. And I like the Lieutenant Kilgore reference. Okay. What did you say you covered today? We covered a great conspiracy theory today that says that Taylor Swift is going to run for president in 2024. Laura Loomer posted it, and it's really, really funny because she posted it like a week ago, and it sounds like hogwash. But then the one of the ladies on The View today, the one that used to work for Trump, I always forget her name, said like the only Karina? person that could beat uh, Donald Trump in 2024 is Taylor Swift. And they're probably right. She could. She could. By the power of white women, she could she could absolutely probably win the election. Wait, so the conspiracy theory is that Taylor Swift is some kind of political plant? I saw this on House and Habit too. I don't know what the yes, fuck she was talking she about. Was talking was like, you should. I Jessica sent you some articles. It. Have you lost it, Jessica. <laughs> no, I no. I sent today. you. I sent you some tweets. You should. You should see if you can pull those up. Um, just look up uh, Laura Loomer. Trav. Uh, Laura Loomer. Tr uh, Taylor Swift. Donald Trump. Uh, okay. And, okay. And it, breaks down this long detailed explanation as to why she would be used for the vote 
uh, in 2024. Oh, okay, Basically, I see here, here we go. Let me see, get that here. Go ahead. Pull it. It's great, but uh, you you have to you you should just pull it up so that they can see the actual tweet, and then uh, see if it links to it in there. If it oh, links okay. to it in the Newsweek article, because you got to uh, see her actual tweet is is fantastic. Should I just go to Laura Loomer on? Twitter? Yeah, just I okay. would just go to I would look up Laura Loomer and uh, Taylor Swift and see what comes up. Here's Laura. Uh, Okay. And you have to read it. It's it'll be down farther, but you'll okay, see it. Okay. She she posted a recent one that was basically just like, look, the media is starting to cover now everything that I talked about a week ago. But if you scroll far enough down, you'll see a red um a red box. Here, so, let me share my screen. Oh, you can yeah. see my screen. Yeah, okay. I can see it. You should keep scrolling. Okay, okay. Sorry, I should have found it. Some people there. tweet way too much, that is for sure. Uh -huh, we'll find it. We'll uh, find it. It's it, no, let's keep going, keep going. Um did it's... Laura Loomer get deplatformed? So she okay, so to people who don't know who she is, she's like a, a right wing media figure. She got deplatformed, right? A while yeah, back. a couple of years back or whatever. I'm I, I make no I have no opinions really of, of her, but uh, this is just the the detail to it is just it's just fantastic. All right, the, I'm gonna um, I have it on. You sent me in a message too. I can yeah, I sent it. I sent see. it to you in a message, and it's it's really really good. Uh, and yeah, she basically says like uh, the the idea that she would cut a deal with George Soros to make a, a voting post because she wants to get her music rights back, and George Soros is the one who funded the purchasing of her first six albums through a private equity firm. Uh huh. And that she's going to be out of the country up until. Uh, three like just right before the election, which she'll be in Florida, <laughs> which is a swing state right now, and also not to be conspiratorial, but she's will be thirty. She would be thirty four during the election. She would turn thirty five a month before the inauguration. Uh oh, uh oh. So she would technically be able to do so. Well, I will say this about Taylor Swift. I mean, she's basically conquered everything that you can conquer in uh, in yeah, her politics, industry. <laughs> politics would actually be a downgrade for her. She has more power in in culture as a pop as a pop cult as a pop culture figure than she ever would as a politician. Yeah, I'm just gonna send this to myself. What you yeah. sorry, what you sent me here. Um, do you? I'm just tired of hearing about her and, and Travis Kelsey. Yes. Does, he, does he fit in with this? Is so? Is this? Part oh of yeah, the because conspiracy? because he's uh yeah because he's a Pfizer shill who just did an ad for Bud Light. So okay. the, the her her tweet covers literally all of it. It's it's hilarious, <laughs> and I am sick to death of like having to talk about her in a relationship. I don't care about, but the idea of her as like a political operative is oh, hilarious God, help to us. me. No, no more. Uh, but, yeah. but it makes sense that the media has rallied around her that much. Yeah. Okay. That way. Here we go. Okay. So it says, um, uh, go to the, you know, read the oh, tweet on the side. The yeah. Okay. You, you so read, yeah. It says, has Taylor Swift made a deal with George Soros and Alex Soros <laughs> to get the rights to her music back in exchange for getting zoomers registered to vote democratic against president Trump ahead of the election. Gen Z plus Taylor Swift equals Gavin Newsom in the White House. The only way Gavin Newsom gets to the White House if, if people is if people with influence start normalizing his radical policies like vaccine mandates, late term abortion, Gavin Newsom, et cetera. Okay. So then she says last week, Taylor Swift registered over 40,000 voters with a single Instagram post. One tweet. Wow. One Instagram, one, Most... one Instagram post. And we all know that every one of those people votes a certain way, one way. And well, is that true? I guess the, I know oh, the yeah. younger generations do vote uh, more to the left. Um, and then it says, okay, later on down, it says, and now she's dating a pro athlete, uh, Travis Kelsey, who just signed with Pfizer to push the COVID vaccines to a million. <laughs> but, well, look, it is quite an extensive uh, conspiracy theory. I am not one for theories like this, so I'm going to decline, but I will say that it is pretty hilarious. And I saw, um, I saw House and Habit. I saw Jessica Krause talking about yeah. it and I was yeah. like, what is she talking about? Taylor Swift, uh, political conspiracy <laughs> i love it that's way more interesting also because the guy she's dating is an athlete and she's never really been a, a dating athletes before. It is a why is she pairing. dating this guy it right a, so if i'm going to be forced to talk about taylor swift and believe me like the cult like i don't really have a say in a lot in a lot of ways like i can decline to cover things but when something has that much cultural relevance you kind of got to go with it. And she's a very big deal right now. And I'd rather, if I have to talk about her, I'd rather talk about her as like some type of like political operative 
uh, that's out to uh, change the change America forever in the favor of George Soros because that's just funnier to me than caring about who she's dating. Yeah, I'll go with that. I'll go with that. The conspiracy <laughs> theory, it's more interesting than than having to uh, – I'm just tired of seeing Travis Kelsey – going around grinning everywhere i don't know i've just had enough of him but uh i found this happy new year hat it's just uh, this happy new year crown is just sitting there i put this on and confuse people what's going on here if they, if they click like, on this wow, it was new year's <laughs> i know if they just happen to randomly click on this they'll uh they'll wonder okay we actually got the... that'd be great to like like every time there's a holiday just wear like the next holiday's clothing <laughs> Oh, I like that tradition, actually. That's a new tradition we could start. When Christmas comes, you wear the New Year hat. When, when, like, right before Christmas, or then at Thanksgiving, you wear Christmas stuff. At Christmas, you wear New Year's stuff. Mm hmm Yes. I like that. Well, yep. you know, um, and by the way, thank you, Manny Ortega, for the $20 super chat. You're appreciated. Uh, this is my, this has always been my issue with Halloween and, and dressing up on Halloween. And it's why I haven't worn a costume in a long time because when everyone else wears costumes, then it, there's nothing like really very special about it. Like you, like when I go to a Halloween party and I see everybody in costumes, including me, it's just like a sea of just kind of ridiculous looking people. But so here's my idea is that instead of that, that on everyone's birthday, you get to dress up in a costume. I think, okay. I think that would actually be, that would be more interesting. So like when it's your birthday, you'll dress up as whatever you want to dress up like. I think that, you know, that way it's more <clears throat> distinctive. Everybody's paying attention to you. Whereas if you just go to a Halloween party, it's just like a sea of ridiculousness. In my, the my the problem is we're in this crazy narcissistic culture where people embrace the idea of birthday week or even worse <laughs> birthday month. If, if you find yourself pursuing a lady and that lady says birthday week, you should be alarmed. If that lady birthday says week. birthday I've month. I've never heard birthday week. You're the, the first person says, to bring that up to me. <laughs> this is a thing. This is a thing. Uh, if she says birthday month, run. Run as fast <laughs> as you can the other direction. I don't like the term narcissist because I think it's overused. But I imagine if somebody believes that they get a whole month to celebrate oh, their birthday, Lord. they're a little bit narcissistic. Oh my lord! High maintenance. I would definitely bet. I would definitely bet on the high maintenance part. Uh, that's that's funny. Birthday week, birthday month. Well, this you know you bring something up here actually, or that that I was wanting to say earlier and I forgot about it. Um, we were talking about we were talking about how nowadays when you hear allegations, like particularly of a me too mm -hmm. nature, you just kind of feel like sort of cynically, like, well, I don't know what to believe or, or what, whatever. Right. I was talking to somebody the other day about me too stuff and whatever. And I, and I was saying to this person that I, I, I just feel like it's so easy nowadays for people to lie. And I feel like there are so many people who are incentivized for various reasons to lie and whatever. And she said something very interesting. It was Lisa Carley. If you're actually, if you're on the stream, mm -hmm. She said, I think there's a generational thing here because I think that older generations, you know, like the greatest generation types and before that, and maybe, you know, kind of extending into the later years, but like that these older generations, there was much more of an appreciation for the, for being honorable, telling the truth, standing by your word and not being overly melodramatic and emotional and, 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 and being, you know, practical and sticking to the, sticking to the, the truth of things that, that you don't, that generations now, even including myself to an extent in this, right. Uh, that generations now don't have that sense of honor or that appreciation. And instead what we value or what our society values are, you know, are things like victimization and drama, melodrama and all of that. And that it's really destabilizing our experience of, of truth and fiction or truth and falsity. Do you think there's something to that? Yeah. It's the push of postmodernism. If there's no objective reality, who's to say what's objectively true, right? That's where that maybe the most infuriating of all those terms is the term my truth, which right. is a contra which is an extreme contradiction, right? In in a lot of ways. So how do you expect to be able to get to the truth when truth is based on how you feel rather than what you actually objectively experienced in your life? What was that that uh, AOC had that famous clip where she said people are more concerned with being uh, factually correct than morally right, which though they should run, they should be the same thing. 
Right. 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 But right. that's not how they see it. And that's not how a lot of people in the world see it. They put a lot of emphasis on the idea of lived experience mm -hmm. and how you perceive that. And that's postmodernism. And in, in a lot of ways, that's uh, tearing down the fabric of what we consider to be objective reality. We talked about a story today. I, I literally I can't even, I can't even explain it. This it's a, a date so bad it felt fake. But the point is, the lady who is on this date that is objectively awful, she's like a the uh, she's like a female version of like a of like a manosphere type. She's like uh -huh. a girl version of that. Like a Mary was calling her, it was like womanosphere or something. The point is, she doesn't exactly look like the nicest person in the world, and she was wearing a shirt in a photo that said "I heart lying." Oh my God. <laughs> no, but I, I think that, and I, and I get what you're saying about postmodernism and, and I will agree with that up to a point. I think that, you know, I studied postmodernism obviously a lot in, in college and in grad school. And I think that there is a certain strain of it that is actually really valuable in the, the idea of like in a sort of a Nietzschean sense, the idea that you should be able to question any anything, mm. even society's most foundational or most assumed truths, and also that there is a sense to which uh, one's experience of life or truths might be relative to a de degree or morality. But but having said all of that, I do really think that that younger generations, maybe starting around the boomers or and and then beyond, have lost generally speaking, have lost a sense of an appreciation for things like old fashioned honor and telling the truth. And I think that there's so with the media now, I think that there's so much, um, there's so many ways in which the media, I don't just mean the mainstream media, but like, you know, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, that it's, it, it incentivizes people to come up with great stories, you know, like, and, and, and it almost a kind of a gossipy sense that's gotten out of control. Sorry, my guys. six my six year old came to me and asked, "Why is Do when is Donald Trump going to send us to the?" <laughs> That's you know right. what I mean? That's it's right, it, right. it's this like those stories where somebody like uh, I actually hate those more yeah, than yeah, anything. Yeah, not, yeah, just, yeah. not just not just no, those, but anybody who makes a post who's like well, they're obviously was, making up something for some yes. effect from some dramatic effect. And and at one point, it's like it would be great if you just said it as a story. Like it doesn't necessarily like it's like the comedian has, <clears throat> excuse me, Hassan Minaj got outed recently for embellishing and lying about stories that he's used in his comedy act. And there was a big debate about whether that was OK or not. Now, for most people, I think like I, I would have normally fallen on the side of like, look, it's comedy, it's art, right. it's performance. But when you're pushing the story is true and that story has racial undertones mm. and it's painting people in a certain light, you know, I wonder, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, like I wonder how honest or fair that is to because you're reporting it as reality you're making people think that that's really yes. happened and if it's a hot button issue then you might be uh, yeah. uh, reinforcing an yeah. untrue view of things and damaging yeah. yeah and and i struggle with that because on one hand i say look creative freedom and the ability to create what you want is paramount but at the same time, am I going to be upset if he loses uh, a job on The Daily Show because he embellished stories and then lied about it? Like, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to do that. He also like there was also this a couple of other comedians that have fallen into that trap before. But it's like when it's being used on issues that are extremely divisive, I get why people are feel hoodwinked or lied to about something like that. I feel similarly about movies that purport to be historical, but that, yeah. but that, but that make uh, key additions or subtractions or alterations. And so, and I know that this is most movies, but, uh, but like, I, I understand people say, well, it's, it's not reality. It's, it's drama, it's fiction, except that it's passing itself off as true. And when you put the label on there, based on a true story, yeah. most people are not going to, are not going to realize that what that means is that there's a lot of fiction in it. Now, some things are more accurate than others. I'll tell you one uh, movie that uh, it's a military, we were talking about military movies the other day, yeah. post 9-11 movies. This one is really, really accurate, but also, and really interesting. Um, 13 hours about uh, the yep. attack on yep. the Libyan, the Libyan consulate. Yep. Uh, excellent, excellent movie. If you like, y'all check it out. If you like military movies or what have you, but it was actually, from what I've read, it was it was very accurate down to like the the minute or what have you. But uh, anyway, my point is though, 
I do feel like there's a responsibility on the part of filmmakers and screenwriters if you are depicting something that is was a real historical event, unless there is a really good reason for you to take artistic license and people are clear that you're doing that, like they, they yeah. know that this is an, is an interpretation of history, you really need to try to get it right because it's kind of like you're, you're messing with people's understanding of reality. Yep. So. It's like uh, it's like how Wikipedia now updates and changes things to remove uh, to remove facts. Like you're, you're, they uh, they they've updated. Like what one thing we were talking about earlier was that uh, Wikipedia has uh, gotten rid of. Um, it's it used to have like a fairly accurate definition of cultural Marxism on the Wikipedia page. Now it labels it a right wing conspiracy theory and completely change the definition of it. And the same thing is true in movies and television. I, I, Argo is one of my favorite movies of all time. And there's a lot of, oh, liberties. and there's a lot of liberties in that. Yeah. It is a good but movie, I, but, but yeah. I love that movie. But when I watch that movie, like I'm not looking for it for like, especially the idea that like the, the guy who he plays, it's Tony Menendez or, or Mendez or whatever. Uh, first of all, he was like five. He's like my height. Right. And he's being portrayed. First of all, he's being oh, portrayed they all, by Ben they always Affleck. Get the physical stuff wrong. Of yeah. course. Yeah. <laughs> and he's being portrayed by Ben Affleck. Who's like over well over six feet, not to mention Ben Affleck isn't exactly Hispanic, but he got, he got permission from him to like, basically he was okay with that. But I always laugh at that. Right. Like I love that movie, but the idea, he always said like the, the reason it was easy, like the reason he was able to do his job as a spy was because he blended into the, to the background. Right. He just looked mm -hmm. like the everyday guy. Ben Affleck is tall. He's mm -hmm. dark and he's got dark hair. He's handsome. Uh, he's not exactly like uh, one of the things that I used to actually point out every time I'd see it on a show is like, thank you for portraying what I think actual spies probably look like, which is not dapper and super handsome. But I imagine there's plenty of uh, people who do it who are just normal looking people. Yes, I would yeah. imagine most. I would imagine for the most part <laughs> that yeah. is. Um, OK, so we got about 10 minutes left. Uh, what what have we not covered that you're interested in? I'm, I want to tell everybody we don't have time to get into Sam Bankman Freed. But what I'm doing, actually, is I'm going to work on a video or put out a video in the next few days uh, talking about his case and his trial and all that. I don't think he's falsely accused or anything like that. The guy does deserve to spend some time in prison. But uh, I just think it's an interesting interesting case so i'll be looking at that but have you followed this at all do you no, have any thoughts on it not not past the arrest uh obviously when the arrest first happened and uh and knowing that tom brady was involved in it was kind of funny apparently like uh that's that's the extent of my knowledge on that i like that chat you just put up on the screen though that was good about oh, uh, emotional tr about emotional truth Oh, yeah. So let me find that again. That's uh, that is Saqib. Saqib, I'm sorry if I'm not saying your name correctly, but he is one of my um, I would say one of my. Oh, there we go. He is probably one of my brightest uh, commenters and followers. He always has uh, really people should follow him, by the way. Find him on Twitter. He, he goes by that name. Uh, he's got a lot of cool observations. But anyway, he says mm. my generation is focused on emotional truth rather than facts. Yeah, I think I think that's but right. And that's what's scary is even the term emotional truth is div is divisive in a lot of ways because a lot of people would see emotional experience as subjective, not objective, right? So when uh, Aziz Ansari has this experience with this woman mm -hmm. uh, and they both perceive that experience differently, who's to tell her that her emotional truth is un is not real right is not the right. real thing uh and a lot of it is like we have a culture because of our phones because of the way that we are pandered to in society now we are in a very growing in a very narcissistic culture that wants you to focus on you rather than focusing on other things right we don't even push the idea of family anymore why would you want to have a family the world's going to end in 10 years <laughs> why would you want to why would you want to have a family everyone gets divorced like they want everybody to focus on immediate gratification instant gratification and their own pleasure rather than anything that helps your fellow man. I will say, and this is a conversation for, uh, maybe we can talk about this. This would be a great philosophical debate for next time. As somebody who doesn't have children, won't yeah. be having children, I I do, and I know that's not what, you, you were not oversimplifying things, but I do get weary at times of the oversimplification of this choice is like, if you have a family, mm -hmm. then you're doing something selfless. If you don't, then you're doing something selfish. I think that that's, yeah. That's a really incorrect, by and large, characterization of, of, of the fact, too, that a lot of people, most people have children actually for selfish 
reasons. And then most, and then people who don't, you know, there's actually a kind of a sacrifice at the end that's going to really bite, bite us. But, but I do think that I agree with you that it seems like society is really, it is really incentivizing all of these pathological, unhealthy drives and behaviors that are not helping. They're not helping to, like you said, like with family to really build a, a good civilization, a good society. It is all of this navel gazing and like Saqib was saying, this narcissistic focus on one's emotional state. And yeah. I'll say this too. We talked about, you brought up the idea last week of uh, the, the notion that perhaps people are getting too much therapy and that there's too much sort of wallowing in, in one's traumas and emotions. And I think that there is, I do think that there's an extent to which a lot of people, particularly in Western society, particularly younger generations, think that it is strengthening to to really wallow in mm. one's emotions and to wallow in one's feelings of victimization and, of, and feelings of, of unfairness and all of that, when really I think a lot of that is yeah. just a kind of a negativity that will just make you bitter and make you self-focused. <laughs> I found that, like, at least for me, and of course this is not a be-all, end-all solution for everybody, that the concept of gratitude, even when you're struggling, is is really important. Meaning that even like my life before the the world that I'm living in now, before this job, before getting myself back on track and fixing the mistakes that I had made for myself, and there were a lot. Like the person I was two and a half years ago was objectively uh, it, finally like I was on the better side of sobriety, but I was still so damaged from all the things that I had done to myself. Mm. But at every step of healing. I saw this as something to be grateful for, even with all the rest of the things that I still have to get through, even with all of the hardship I knew I was going to have to pull myself out of if I wanted to have a productive life as an adult, I never allowed myself to wallow in what I still had to do, but more about what I had already managed mm. to get done and how grateful I was just to be, al in a lot of cases, just to be alive. Mm -hmm. Just to still be breathing amid all after all the mistakes and all the chances in which I could have very much ended. Like I've told a lot of people, I said, look, I expected to be dead. I expected to be dead in my found dead in my apartment at one point in time in my life. It was that broken. And if mm -hmm. you can feel gratitude on just on the outskirts of that, even when you're still basically starting your life from scratch in your mid 30s then I think that uh, uh, the ability to feel that sense of gratitude for the smallest of things can help color your perspective on macro side, you know, on, on issues on the macro scale that may seem, you know, unsolvable, but. I, I'm into that. And I think, you know, I, along with what you're saying there about gratitude for where you've gotten in life and, and where you're at psychologically, I think that, there are a lot of people nowadays, and I'm not holding myself up as any paragon of virtue in this sense, because I'm not nearly as educated as I'd like to be. But there are a lot of people who basically don't know any history. And one of the reasons why, and I used to teach uh, history on film in college, and I would tell students, one of the main reasons why you should study history, yes, of course, you want to understand the past, you're not condemned to repeat it, and blah, blah, blah. But I think personally, one of the main reasons to study history is because it makes you so fucking grateful yeah. for your life because you realize that on the whole, and yes, I know there are serious things like cancer and rape and trauma, but on the whole, we realize that the things that we are dealing with are certainly not special. And in fact, generally speaking, are way, way better than what others have. And this is why when I talk about uh, me too. And I talk about um, the, the notion of sexual assault today in our society and how I yeah. think it's really been broadened past the point of what it really should mean. I, I so often bring up um, World War II and like what happened in Berlin after the war ended when the Russians came through and what those women endured just as a way of pointing out to people like, you know, when you when you really understand how dark human history can get and how dark the human experience can get yeah. and how just grotesque and awful and terrifying, yeah. then it gives you usually, I think, a better perspective, a lighter perspective on what you're going through, you know, yeah. yeah. in art. Perspective and distance from your own problems is never a bad thing, I don't think. I think to, to be able to look at those things. But I'm also one of those people where for me – I think it's just I, I I put my also I I had the blessing of being responsible for my own uh, 
the the problems that I had. There are things that I could say that might have been uh, I, the other people that I could implicate in certain aspects of it. But at the end of the day, I whatever's done to you, okay, good. Now what are you going to do about it? That's always been right. my mentality, right? Okay, so the worst thing in the world was done to you. What are you going to do to do about it? And everybody's had those experiences, but the, and sometimes you can go too far with it. There is absolutely the possibility that sometimes you're so focused on making sure that you take responsibility for your own future, that you do kind of uh, ignore the fact that you might've been wrong done by. And that's not always a good thing. If you let them, if you allow those people to remain in your life. Right. Sure. Sure. But in general, like it's just, it's very difficult for me to focus on, to, to see these, I, I find it weird to focus on all of these things that are oftentimes outside of our control when the majority of your decisions that you make on a daily basis, it's why I tell people don't focus on uh, like go, like federal level politics. Your state level politics are more likely to impact your life anyways. It's a lot easier to focus on um, like huge issues like racism, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, all these things, rather than ask yourself, how did the decisions I made today affect my life? Oh, yeah. Well, the personal responsibility thing, that is always, that's always going to be something that we can all, I know I can do better in for sure. All right. So I want to make sure as we close up here that we get to the super chats. There were a couple I overlooked. Bohemian Babs. Oh, I like that name. Bohemian Babs. It's gotten so the news is no better than the Inquirer. Yes, unfortunately, <laughs> generally yes. true. I would like somebody to make an art project where you take some of these Fox headlines, some of these CNN headlines or MSNBC headlines, and instead of looking at them on their websites, do do a mock-up of the Inquirer and put those headlines <laughs> on there, and you'll notice that they don't really look all that much yeah, different. Yeah, no, it's not. That's, I mean, that's true. Uh, Steph, thank you for the super sticker. and I th Thank you, Steph. And I think that is, is that everybody? Yeah, we got Manny earlier. I think that's everybody. So um, I put the link up earlier. I'm going to put it up one more time for a Pop Culture Crisis. Everybody make sure that you check out uh, Brett's show five days a week. And it's, I've five been there before. I've been yes. there before. It's we're a good gonna time. We're going to have you back at some, we're going to have you, we're going to have you back at some oh, point. Well, uh, you got to come back, time. not watch I, Barbie this time. <laughs> Okay, so uh, it says Colonel Kurtz there, but that's uh, that's the link. So that's the link for Pop Culture Crisis. I will put it below in the comments to um, when I post the video. And uh, yeah, and then there's my tip jar as well, which uh, you can find. It'll also be posted in the comments below, and you can find it under any of my videos. So um, also, Julie Moss, thank you. I saw your, um, your tip there on the PayPal. And... Um, and Dallas, thank you for that. Thank you for the work you do. I watch your YouTube videos every day. Appreciate it. Oh, and uh, Julie wanted me to let you know that she's really enjoying the shows with Brett. So awesome. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much. yeah, and thank you, uh, Thomas, as well. All right. So everybody, I have got to go. Um, we will see you next time. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. And we are ending these.